Hey, what's up everybody? I'm going to do a classic rock reaction. Uh, this is Led Zeppelin, man. Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin from the fourth album. This is a uh, starting side two of Led Zeppelin four. And it's a song called Misty Mountain Hop. Misty Mountain Hop, Led Zeppelin. Let's get it. That's a piano going. He's really telling a story here, man. Go down in the streets today, baby. You better, you better. 
that story he was telling her. Like, Misty Mountain Hop. First and foremost, right off the top of my head, I really, really dig the presence of the uh, piano and the keyboards in this song. It just goes to show that there is a place for the piano and the organ and the keyboards in rock and roll. Utilized very, very well here. I really enjoyed hearing it in parts in the background. Excellent. Yo, man, this, I've heard this song before. I've heard this song a number of times before. Um, and it's taken me back to uh, a number of parties, um, my Navy days, probably my Navy days. Um, all of that drinking and slam dancing at the junior ranks mess. It's got to be those times. And... Um, I, uh, the two things, got an echo going on, there I can hear myself, the two things that um, I remember about this song, first impressions, the two things was um, that uh, background beat, down, 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 and then after um, uh, the drums, the, the drums seemed to be really amplified in my head and those are the two things that I remember about this song the most uh, I didn't know who sang it I didn't know what uh, it was about what the subject matter was about but I remember um, the beat and I remember the drums in this song and I remember the fact that I've heard this tune a number of times and it's taken me back to my uh, was it my army days? No, it was more my navy days when I was um, doing a lot of uh, partying at the at the junior ranks mess. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing what music will uh, do, where it'll take you. Fantastic song, man. And you know, this song, man, he has a very, very specific message in this song. This song. Um, if I can get it all straight, he's singing about some form of uh, discrimination. Um, him and his friends are just having a nice time. and uh, The police are harassing them and the people around them don't even uh, care. They're just maybe passing by type of thing. And um, I think he's singing about some sort of discrimination here. But uh, anyway, man, hey, yo, beyond that, the musicianship, it was just slaying me. The musicianship is just so on point. So their progression from the first album all the way now to the fourth album is uh, remarkably, their musicianship has actually even improved remarkably. You know, uh, I say remarkably because um, in the first the first album, the first couple of songs I was listening to it, I was saying to myself, and my dad has repeated this to me, um, how is it that these 20-year-old kids can be so on their shit? This is him, not me. Um, where precision playing is uh, concerned. And I said that to myself, uh, listening to their first couple of songs, and now all the way to the fourth album. It's incredible how... Uh, their precision is a lot more tight. I'm going to use the word tight. I usually use it to describe um, Rush's playing. But yo, man, this song is an excellent example of tight precision playing. And they've got a medley of um, uh, instruments going on in here, including the keyboards, the piano. Man, fantastic. Five out of five, definitely with the musicianship. The vocals are incredible. He is got to. He's got to be one of the best rock singers ever. I would put him definitely up there in the top echelon, if not number one. He's to me like a combination of uh, 
like a Freddie Mercury and a Jeff Buckley, something like that. Maybe spiced with a little Ian Gillen, something. Uh, he is just got um, such a great signature voice, but he's got a commanding way of singing where when he wants you to hone in on just him, on just the subject matter of what he's singing about, he has a little bit more of a raspy, throaty delivery in it that commands more of your attention to him and his singing. Um, a really good example of that, the best example I can think of so far, is in uh, Dazed and Confused. When it's he's singing and it's an emotional delivery and it's a it's a lamenting almost where he wants every single person who has suffered this similar uh, circumstance to relate to what he's singing and he's leaning into it with his emotional uh, element. That's the best example I can think of. There's I'm probably going to um, discover more songs like that, but uh, yeah, man. Um, that is how I feel about Robert Plant's singing. It's on different levels. And in this particular song, he was leaning into it a little bit more because he really wanted you to get the message of what he was conveying. There's some sort of a social um, uh, element in here that he wants you to pick up. And uh, that's what I'm getting anyway. I know I'm overthinking things, but you know, when you're sitting like this, you don't have any distractions. You don't have, you're, there's no parties. There's nothing going on. It's just you sitting here and just listening to a song. You can't help but really get in deep. I get in really, really deep into it because there's no outside distractions and I'm focused a hundred percent on the music, you know what I'm saying? You should try that. So, I mean, like, I know you've done that. You know, this is Led Zeppelin we're talking about. But I get a lot out of doing it like this. If I was el elsewhere and anything else was distracting me, I wouldn't pick up as much as I do. Uh, but I know that sometimes I overthink things. So I'm going to shut up and then uh, get onto my structure here and not do so much damn talking. Um, I talk a lot when something really gets me. And this song really gets me on so many levels, man. Fantastic beat, great at a party, great when you're sitting and listening and analyzing, breaking things down. It's great for a lot of things, man. All right, so Misty Mountain Hop. What I'm gonna do real quick, man, is I'm just gonna do a little quick intro of the band, um, and then I'm gonna do a little bit of song uh, background here. Now this is just my format for those of you who are just joining me for the first one, uh, for the first time. Okay, man. So let's up it. <clears throat> let's up it. Led Zeppelin were an English rock band formed in London in 1968. The group consisted of guitarist Jimmy Page, singer Robert Plant, bassist and keyboardist John Paul Jones, and drummer John Bonham. The band's heavy guitar-driven sound has led them to be cited as one of the progenitors of heavy metal. Their style drew from a wide variety of influences, including blues, psychedelia, and folk music. After changing their name from the New York Birds, Led Zeppelin signed a deal with Atlantic Records that afforded them considerable artistic freedom. Although the group were initially unpopular with critics, they achieved significant commercial success. Led Zeppelin are widely considered one of the most successful, innovative, and influential rock groups in history. They are one of the best-selling music artists in the history of audio recording. Various sources estimate the group's record sales at 200 to 300 million units worldwide, with RIAA certified sales of 111.5 million units. They are the third best-selling band in the U.S. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995. The museum's biography of the band states that they were as influential during the 1970s as the Beatles were during the 1960s. That last part right there is so astounding, man. All right, so that's uh, intro of the band. Uh, let's just check out some... Uh, 
intro of the song. <coughs> Sorry, I lost my page. Hang on. There we go. So, okay. Misty Mountain Hop. Misty Mountain Hop is a song from English rock band Led Zeppelin's untitled fourth album, released in 1971. In the United States and Australia, it was the B-side of the Black Dog single, but still received considerable radio airplay. It was recorded at Headley Grange, a mansion with a recording studio in Hampshire, England. The most common interpretation of the song's title involves a reference to the Misty Mountains in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. The Misty Mountains. So I'm packing away to go to the Misty Mountains, where the spirits go. He, um, okay, yeah, I get it now. So, in the song, he's saying, uh, I've had enough of this nonsense and I'm going to go away um, where I'm free. That's what he's really saying. So, the Misty Mountains is where uh, King Aragon went to summon the dead warriors. Uh, to fight for his cause. And they um, recognize his authority by uh, seeing the reforged blade of... Uh, the blade of... I can't remember what the blade was called. Um, <clears throat> so it's the Misty Mountains that King Aragon went to to summon the, um, the lost warriors or the dead warriors. I can't remember the name of the group of warriors at the Misty Mountains. It makes sense. I made a connection there. And I lost my damn way. <clears throat> the lyrics refer to the events of the 7th of July, 1968, Legalese Park Rally in Hyde Park, London, in which police made arrests for marijuana possession. The lyrics reflect Plant's quest for a better society, a place and a time when hang-ups are replaced with individual freedom and a life of mutual support and rapport. Okay. So it was a rally where there were arrests made. So yeah, going back in 68, still a lot of very, very conservative uh, people uh, around at that point in time, especially people in the positions of authority like the police. <coughs> Robert Plant explained, quote, it's about a bunch of hippies getting busted, about the problems you can come across when you have a simple walk in the park on a nice sunny afternoon. In England, it's understandable because wherever you go to enjoy yourself, Big Brother is not far behind." Unquote. Okay, so that encapsulates the entire meaning of the song right there. Okay, got it. The Misty Mountains are in Wales. They are referred to in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Return of the King. Plant is a big fan of Tolkien and used references to the Lord of the Rings series from time to time. Robert Plant found himself drawn to Wales and eventually settled in Worcestershire, near the Welsh border. I miss the Misty Mountains, the wet Welsh climate, he told Rolling Stone in 2017. I like weather people run away from. Led Zeppelin wrote and recorded this at Headley Grange, a mansion with a recording studio in Hampshire, England, where the band sometimes lived. Jimmy Page wrote the song one night while the rest of the band was sleeping. This begins with John Paul Jones playing electric piano. The band performed this at the Atlantic Records 40th anniversary concert in 1988 with Jason Bonham sitting in on drums for his late father. They played it again with Jason at the 21st birthday party for Robert Plant's daughter Carmen, and again in 2007 at a London benefit concert for the Amet Ertigon Education Fund. Okay, yeah, that's the uh, O2 Arena concert that I still haven't seen. Okay. Okay, and so that is Wikipedia Song Fact Info on Misty Mountain Hub. Hang on a sec, man. I'm gonna... I, uh, I just want to bring up the lyrics to this song. Uh, 
There's a part there about the Misty Mountains. Uh, okay, it's at the bottom, the bottom paragraph. So I've decided what I'm going to do now. So I'm packing my bags for the Misty Mountains, where the spirits go now. Over the hills where the spirits fly. Okay, so this signifies his desire to get away from all of this nonsense and go somewhere where he'll be uh, free and uh, at peace. Okay. Lord of the Rings reference. That's cool, man. All right. Um, yo. This song is a great song for so many reasons. For the musicianship, for the the lyrical content, the spirit of Robert Plant's delivery, the message behind it all. And uh, I like the whole element where the song connects you to the, the times of what was happening um, back then. I really like traveling back in time and getting a feel for how the artists were inspired by what was going on around them. Those times were very, very um, trying times but also times of great creativity. And again, it's depositing all of those elements that made these classic rock artists such great creators of the classic rock signature. And it's their experiences back then in those times that was one of those great contributors. Um, I call it the creative renaissance period where everybody all across the board, not just classic rock artists, but all genres, they were just really on their game. They were really on point where it comes to the creative element. And um, I think it's just a combination of the time and all of the things going on back then that helped to create this great uh, renaissance of creativity, especially in classic rock, man. Fantastic. Um, yeah, to date, doing my little classic rock reactions and stuff like that, I keep going back to that period of time that renaissance period of time as uh, and trying to dissect what it is that made these artists so good at creativity and why it seems to a certain extent we're missing some of that today. Um, I'm not saying that we're completely missing uh, a lot of it. I'm just saying a little bit of it. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so, all right, man. What else do I want to say about this song? Uh, I'm just going to scroll down here <clears throat> to my notes before I bounce. And, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I wrote something down here in my notes. Okay, man. Hmm. Do I even want to get into this? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to get into this. I got a question. I have a question. Um, it's not a note. It's not an update. <clears throat> it's a question. I want to talk to, and I want to ask this question of um, Christians, rock and roll fans who are Christians. <clears throat> Excuse me, man. I need some lemon drops real bad. But uh, I want to ask this question of Christians, not just Christians, but believers. I mean, you know, as a believer, you don't necessarily uh, go to church every Sunday. You don't necessarily pray every single day type of thing. But as a believer, you believe in the gospel of Christ. You believe in Jesus and the authority that he has as uh, the Messiah. You believe in Christianity. You know, you don't necessarily pray every day. You're a believer, though. So I want to ask this question of uh, Christians and believers. And um, first off, let me tell you what happened to me in the last two weeks. So then it'll set up this question uh, because it's still fresh and it's still raw in my emotions. Um, <clears throat> in doing these reactions, I sometimes encounter a lot of aggression in the comment section, uh, especially for, from certain people who might not agree on what I'm reacting to. I'll give you an example couple of weeks ago when I was doing my Black Sabbath 
Artist of the Month reactions, um, a couple of real ignorant people peddling themselves to be Christians started coming in and throwing harsh judgment down on me and some of my uh, Black Sabbath fans. You know, fire and brimstone, hell and fury, the Lord is going to roast you in the lake of fire and all of this sort of thing. You're a backslider, all of this sort of stuff, man. I actually even had to block a few of these people calling themselves Christians. And they were coming in and they were uh, insulting the Black Sabbath fans and they were even calling people uh, names, um, insulting um some people's moms. Holy cow. So I had to block a few people. If you go back to my Black Sabbath reactions and check out the comments, you're going to see what I'm talking about. There's a few threads there. Okay. So what happened to me? I hooked up with a buddy of mine, an old Navy buddy of mine. And um, we um, went to his parents' house and help them do a little bit of spring cleaning and that sort of thing, clean up the backyard. And then of course we turned it into a really, really nice backyard barbecue slash party. So by the end of it all, you know, they had a lot of friends and family come over. There was like around 40 people at the end. So uh, my buddy's name is Daryl, Daryl Clark. So his mom um, is 75 year old, a 75 year old old Orthodox Christian woman. She is the matriarch of the family. She is that kind of person who um, has always gone to church, has a very, very, very strong um, uh, point of view about certain things. She has to have the last word. Just a total um, matriarch, dominant matriarch. As a result, her husband and her son are very docile. It's as if you take a bull uh, in a field and you uh, extract his testicles he is now as docile as the cows you know what I'm saying so she has turned these two masculine men very very docile <clears throat> Daryl in a combat situation can kick asses and take names but then when you put him in the same room as his mom he becomes as docile as that bull in the field anyway here we are at their barbecue. Here we are having a good time. She looks up at me and she says, you know, um, I'm a little disappointed that you listen to that rock and roll stuff on your channel. Um, I thought you were a man with good sense. Uh, weren't you raised in a Christian home? Um, I should, then she continued to say, she says, um, these people, they're singing about um, war pigs and uh, that man wants the girl to squeeze his lemon. Um, I expected better from you. This is what she said to me about my reaction channel. This is what she said to me um, in a group setting of 40 to 45 of their friends and family. Yo, man, you come at me like that. So I leaned into this lady and I said, uh, <clears throat> first off, you are not Mrs. Clark to me anymore. You're just Maggie. So first off, I said to this lady, okay, Maggie, you have insulted my intelligence. You have insulted my um, manhood, challenged my manhood, and you've insulted my uh, Christianity. And what you're doing is you're using the Christian element as some sort of a shaming mechanism, a shaming tool. And that is the thing about certain Christians who uh, are trying to win souls to Christ that I have a problem with. It's the way they go about using the Christian element. And uh, in this case, she was using it as some sort of a shaming mechanism to win me over to her way of thinking trying to shame me in front of people publicly. So that got me really upset. That element got me mad. I could have shooed away the other parts and just say, oh, you know, but um, I didn't let it go. And I leaned into this lady, you know, I said, hey, first off, Maggie, you are a Game of Thrones fan, right? She goes, yes. And I said, you like 
Ramsey Bolton and you think that he was the best villain on TV ever, right? She goes, yeah, but that has nothing to do with. So you have nothing, no problem with Ramsey Bolton raping and sodomizing and abusing Sansa Stark all of these seasons. But yet, you understand that it's just a show and that it's just entertainment. So in the same vein, no one is um, judging you for your appreciation for the actor who portrays this beast. But how, how can you turn around and judge me for um, liking a certain element of music? And you've certainly checked out my um, uh, channel long enough to get a gist of what I'm listening to, get a gist of the content of the music, but still you turn an ignorant ear to what the message of the songs are conveying. When you listen to War Pigs, you are judging Black Sabbath for being uh, warmongers but you're not really, really paying attention to the message and to the lyrics. So you are exercising gross ignorance here. Man, all of this is going on while the rest of the friends and the family are around, you know, the kids and stuff. It was a very, very uncomfortable situation, but I was really upset. And um, so she, being the matriarch, being the 75 year old Orthodox Christian, she feels that she's entitled to have the last word. So I put my hand up and I said, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to waste any more time with you. You're just not worth trying to um, even reason with. So I grabbed my doggy bag and I left. Even though I was mad, even though I was upset, I'm definitely going to grab my doggy bag, man. Come on, they made ribs. So Daryl and I were cool later. He called me and he said, hey, yo, that's my mom. That's just how the way she is. That's the way I was raised. Apologies for that. I said, you know what? I totally get it. I understand. Thankfully, Daryl understood and that he had an, um, a really good acceptance of the way his mom was. Otherwise, our friendship could have been done, right? So um, I'm sharing all of this with you guys to ask you this question now. I am a little bit more prepared when someone comes at me like this in the comment section. But when it happens to me, um, for real in my life, uh, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared to um, reasonably um, lay a good argument. You know, um, I responded in a little bit of anger. First off, don't ever do what I did. I went too far. Secondly, uh, here's my question. Um, here's my question to you who are Christians and like rock and roll, believers who like rock and roll. If someone comes to you like this, how are you prepared to answer them? If someone challenges you like this, challenges your faith, judges you for um, being a Christian, but yet you listen to rock and roll, what are you going to say to them? How are you going to um, address it? That's my question, because obviously I know you don't have to tell me that I went a little bit too far. I let my emotions take over and I leaned into this woman. Um, but tell me how you would handle. I'm talking about a face to face interaction like this, especially if there's a whole bunch of people around and it's an uncomfortable atmosphere. What are you going to say? How are you going to address it? You know, um, because I, like I said, I went a touch too far with it and I let anger lead my um, uh, reaction and my response to her. But tell me as a Christian, as a believer, when someone approaches you like this in a shaming manner, especially using Christianity as a shaming mechanism, what are you going to say to them? That's my question to you. Um, and I have to share it with you guys because I know that you would understand what I was feeling, what I was going through. And um, as you're following along with me in my exploration of classic rock and I'm discovering these things, I'm actually um, not just discovering and learning things about rock, but I'm actually learning things about life in itself. I'm being, I'm 
um, being shown these different things, the dynamics of what makes people tick. Um, and for example, you know, when I started this channel, I started getting judged by some so-called friends um, that I've had to shoo away, flaky friends that I've kind of had to shoo away. Oh, you're listening to Black Sabbath, you know, that demonic stuff, you know, so ignorance like that get lost, right? So um, it's still fresh. So sorry if I'm not very um, eloquently uh, laying out a really good foundation for my question, but you get the gist of where I'm going with it. Let me know how, what you think about this. And I obviously know where I went wrong in um, responding to this woman. Um, but let me know in the future, if this happens to you, being a Christian, a believer who likes rock and roll, and you get challenged like this in the way I did, uh, how will you respond? What are you prepared to say? That's what I want to know. I often ask questions uh, in general from different people, but specifically I'm asking this of um, rock and roll fans who are Christians and believers. Let me know about that. Anyway, enough of that, man. Uh, I just want to say overall, this song is fantastic. I'm still really enjoying this um, odyssey I'm taking with Led Zeppelin. And um, I've become a fan of theirs, even beyond their blue stuff. It's a real awesome treat and a nice throwback when I come across one of their blues covers of the old stuff. But uh, even beside that, I'm now a fan of just the group of men because of their tight cohesion and their great musicianship and their great creative uh, element, you know. So there's so much to appreciate about them, you know. Uh, and if I don't come across another blues signature uh, ever again, it's okay because I am now on board and I'm now a fan of the men collectively because they're such an excellent talent and they really, really do uh, some excellent things for the genre of rock and roll. Anyway, with that said, man, I'm going to bounce. I talked so, so long and uh, apologies for being so long winded. I had to get that off my chest. And I knew that uh, you guys, the subscribers, you would understand where I'm coming from. It's not like I can just uh, share this with anybody. You know what I'm saying? So you guys are my, my friends and you're my sounding board. So thanks for joining me, man. And uh, I'll see you. Uh, when is my next Led Zeppelin reaction? Um... I'm just going to my calendar here real quick. Uh, so, uh, yeah, okay. It's a song called Four Sticks. Oh, uh, okay. So where are we? We are at um, the 20th or the 21st. So, yeah, Four Sticks. So my next Led Zeppelin reaction will be um, probably in about five days or six days, something like that. Um, they're separated by a week now because I'm so busy with my life. But uh, yeah, look for my next Let's Up and Reaction uh, four sticks in about five days time. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening to me rant. And um, I'll catch you in my next Zeppelin Reaction. Peace.